Hello and welcome to the latest edition of Beyond the Hype. I'm your host, Alfred Edmund Jr., Senior VP, Executive Editor at Large. And at the top of the year, we have yet another important conversation um, when it comes to black wealth creation, closing the racial wealth gap, and of course, the heart of the black enterprise legacy, which is entrepreneurship and the growth of black business. And I, I got to say, and I'm biased, so I'm always open with my guests about when I have a relationship beyond my work with the people who are on the show. But this is one of my favorite brothers. Uh, we're fellow Rutgers alum. Um, we go we go back. We've, <laughs> we've been on down the road. He's younger than I am. He's like a little brother. He's not he's not my generation. But uh, they, I think he knows how highly I think of him and I, I love him very much. But in, in addition to that, he's a, a, a quite an accomplished person. I'm not telling you guys anything new. I don't need to roll through the whole resume. Um, he is here in his capacity as the chairman of BCT Partners, uh, which is the largest black-owned company in New Jersey and one of the BE100 companies' largest um, black-owned companies in the country. Um, you also may know him for uh, a, what's now, I think, is a classic, um, Black Faces in White Places. But now we have Black Faces in High Places, which is a new classic talking about what, what it means for black people to be successful, particularly in, in the 21st century in corporate America and beyond. Listen, I could spend the next 20 minutes just talking about who you are and what you do, but welcome to the show, Dr. Randall Pinkett. Alfred, I appreciate the introduction, and more importantly, I appreciate the friendship over the years. I've seen your career uh, blossom and flourish uh, from all that you've done uh, to lend your voice to the wealth building, entrepreneurship building, community building efforts, uh, for black people, for black and brown people, for all people, quite frankly. And while I certainly am humbled by your, your words, know that I have and continue to look up to you as a role model, as an example, and just a good brother doing good work. So, uh, you know, the sentiments are mutual yes. and the admiration is bi-directional. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And listen, I'm going to give you some props because uh, I'm going to take you back to uh, early 2020 at the uh, the dawn of the COVID age. And um, I, I'm going to say this, the first ever guest on Beyond the Hype was uh, Datari Turner when we launched the show, the, the, the decorated independent filmmaker, television producer, um, another really good brother. Um, and uh, But I always remind people that the first time I ever interviewed somebody on this kind of a format was with you. I don't know if you remember that interview back in early 2020, um, mm -hmm. when you know, Black and Process was still trying to figure out what we were going to be to survive the pandemic of the business. We were looking at new ways of delivering content that now That's we right. do as a regular blocking and tackling, but it was very experimental in early yeah. 2020 when we couldn't do our live events because of COVID, um, which was a big you know part of our revenue uh, source. We, we weren't printing a magazine anymore. And our you, so you, I tell people you were my beyond the hype guess for episode zero, <laughs> even though we didn't call it Beyond Night. So you were long overdue to be back on the show, and so I'm just glad you, that you could be here. Yeah, well, you, you've you done what every business has, I'm sorry, every business that survived the pandemic has needed to do, which is pivot in the pandemic. And so I, I remember that interview vividly, because to your point, none of us knew what we were doing at the time. Right. We didn't know where we were going. We didn't know what lied ahead in the future. And we were literally make, building the bridge as we were walking across the bridge from what was then the old normal to what is now the new normal. Uh, but I see by my presence here and by the wonderful list of guests you've had on the program for Beyond the Hype, you more than pivoted, man. You've, you've, you know, you've, you've powered through and you know, you've really amplified the range and the methods with which you've been able to amplify your voice so kudos to you for for crossing for building the bridge while you were on the bridge <laughs> right 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 and listen let's let's talk about bct bct partners um you know um, again something else rooted in our Rutgers heritage because of, of your partners were also brothers you met when you were at Rutgers and, and became brothers at Rutgers and became business partners at Rutgers but talk about bct partners my understanding you've had a banner year a, a big year for your company, um, what's going on with BC Two Partners? And tell me, tell me what's happened, um, you know, during 2021 and, and 2022, and now we're at 2023. What's going on? Well, you know as well as I do that in 2020, equity became 
a trend. You know, it, it became the one of the, one of those hot topics. Combine that with the COVID nineteen pandemic, which embedded in the pandemic were also discussions around equity. Who's an essential worker? Who's not? Who has to leave the home to work? Who doesn't? There, there were equity issues, health equity issues embedded in the pandemic. Fortunately, BCT isn't and has always been an equity centered organization. Our mission is centered on harnessing the power of diversity, insights, and innovation to accelerate equity. And so we were doing that work before George Floyd was murdered and before the pandemic hit. But once those two societal events transpired, the demand for our services exploded. And anyone who had diversity or equity or inclusion in their title, the demand for those people exploded. And so we were, you know, they say that success isn't where uh, preparation meets luck. It's where preparation meets opportunity. We were, we were prepared, but then the opportunity, the window of opportunity emerged and we have seen a more than doubling of our revenue. When we hit the BE 100 in 2019, we were about 13 million. We're going to be north of 30 million wow. uh, looking back, exactly, uh, looking back on 2022. And we'll continue to grow into 2023. So it's a measurable sign of the demand for equity centered services. And BCT has been, you know, I say a beneficiary, but I also acknowledge that it's in the midst of tragedy that that opportunity emerged. Yeah, you know, that crisis opportunity uh, uh, equation, which again, is, has been like that since the beginning of time and will always be that way. Um, but but when you talk about, I mean, let's, let's look at it this way. Like you said, if you were in, in any way providing a brand, a service, um, a product that was diversity leaning, and like you, black the issues that we're dealing with today, what Black Enterprise has been about since 1970. So yes, now we, after almost barely scraping through as a media company in 2020, like a lot of media companies, and many of them didn't survive. Yeah, we're we're doing great now. We're doing wonderfully because the work that you know I, I, I talked. I'm trying to remember somebody told me about. It's about getting in the way of opportunity. Like the trends are going to happen. How did how do you get in the way so that that you, you they come you're, they're coming to you because you're in the right space? But we are in fact um, in the right space for this time. Providing um, services and and and, and pushing an agenda that we've always pushed because our, the markets that we serve um, have always needed it, even if they didn't always know it. And in this case, even corporate America needs these th these services and benefits to be the best that they can be, uh, even if there's cultural challenges to them always understanding that. Talk to me about what you're looking to happen with BCT in in, in 2023. Absolutely. So. Throughout 2022 was a year of uh, expanding the work we're doing around diversity, equity, and inclusion, but also acquisition. We acquired our second firm, uh, Community Science, a research and evaluation firm based out of Washington, D.C. 2019, we required a health equity company, Critical Measures, out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, on the, you know, the same Minneapolis, Minnesota of George Floyd's murder. Uh, so we've expanded our footprint considerably. Uh, through mergers and acquisitions. We expect that that will continue into 2023, uh, but we're also expanding uh, how we're leveraging innovation in order to deliver value to our clients. I think what differentiates BCT from other diversity, equity, and inclusion firms is that we're founded by four Rutgers engineers. So we're embracing of information technology, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, machine learning, data analytics, natural language processing. We are bringing some really rigorous, powerful insights to how do you assess an organization? How do you develop data-driven decision-making of what to do for an organization? And how do you measure the impact and the outcomes for that organization? And it's that technological research engineering capability that we're looking to amplify in 2023 uh, through new products and services uh, that we'll introduce to our clients. So yeah, man, I mean, you talk about a double, maybe even triple sweet spot because BCT is a tech company and we, we, we've been probably for the last 30 years been, uh, I'll, I'll say struggling, striving, I'll, I'll, I'll use that word, striving to gain a foothold for black business, for black professionals in the tech space, because obviously that is the space that is driving the economy. 
and and you guys, you know, um, Jeff and, and Dallas and and uh, Lawrence, again, your your partners, have just done a great job. But you were very, you were you were early to the game because it wasn't a game to you. And again, you were in engineering. You you were you were you were pursuing that. So it, it just it just does me does my heart good to see you brothers in the right space at the right time doing the right things. And then, we, of course, we didn't know when we, you, you didn't know when you were undergrads at Rutgers that this would be that COVID was going to happen someday, and you're going to be in the right place at the right time. And George Floyd, obviously, we didn't, we don't the brothers getting murdered is not something that we want to see. But right. this confluence of tech and having a credible uh, black-owned company with black leadership, black management, um, building and, and providing services and tech, along with the, the need to have measurable because engineering is about measurable results, which is right. another good thing about it. Um, it it's just it's just, it's just an interesting study, which I think will be case studies for probably years to come, for what you guys have done with BCT um, in this space, not just for, for black business, but for business in general. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, I, I affectionately refer to the, the, the founding partners as as new addition with no Bobby Brown. That's what I, how I refer to <laughs> us. <laughs> 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 Nobody Bobby had to get wet, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody had to get kicked out of the group for acting the fool. Uh, and we've been able to not just come together but stay together. And yes. and, and you make some really important points. Uh, you know, black representation in the tech space is an area where we're still challenged. Uh, and for us, seeing the increased demand for black owned businesses that we saw post George Floyd. And us being a technology firm that could capitalize on this equity space as a growth space has really differentiated us and distinguished us. There's not a lot of black owned tech firms focused on equity. I don't know, but a handful at best, you no know, BCT. Um, and so it's that, you, you know, that's you, that unique positioning that we always talk about with entrepreneurs is, is this, this eclectic mix of how are you intentional about what you do well and what you can be the best in the world at. But then there's that other element. What is the market demanding? I don't care how good you are at something. If the market's not demanding, it doesn't matter. And, and the art, not the science of entrepreneurship is finding the, the mix of the two. Oh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, many of the entrepreneurs that I mentor, I've said many times, is not always, in fact, it's, it's, it's not usually what people need is what they'll pay for. Yeah, and finding that confluence, you know, you're like, oh, I'm doing this because people need it. I talked to you know young entrepreneurs. I'm starting this business. I'm running this. Business. People really, really need this. I'm like, they you do need it. But how many things do we need as individuals that we're like, but I'm not really going to pay for that. I'm not going to give <laughs> time and the money to do that, even though I know that's what I need. So yeah. you, you're right. It's that balancing act between what you really can, differ, you know, just differentiate yourself um, as as a provider as the best of class, and then that meeting up with. I mean, you know, there once upon a time there was people that made vinyl records better than anybody else, but nobody wants vinyl records. So <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. And that's the other thing I really appreciate. And again, we could do a whole another episode. I'm not, I, I'm praying. I'm I'm telling you this now. I'm putting this out in public. There needs to be a book coming out somewhere around this around the story of you four brothers. Mm. <laughs> because I mean, I know the story because I've known you guys, and we we've, we've, we've had conversations and interviews before in different forms. But just the way you 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 manage your your relationships as partners, the way you the, the business you have now is not the business you guys first started. That's right. Your, your recognition of evolution, pivoting, and then even even now, BCT Partners being in a, being now in a position to acquire other businesses is a very different space than you know even five years ago um, mm -hmm. when you know. So so I just think there's a whole nother show series of shows, business mm -hmm. stories, and books around the story of you guys and, and how you, 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 and the story obviously is not done. Um, but but it, again, I think it's a great case study, it's a great lesson. Um, and hopefully, you know, obviously Black Enterprise will be a part of continuing to tell bits and pieces of that story as time goes by. Yeah, you know, there, there's a great line in one of the songs from uh, Hamilton, the Broadway play. Uh, if, if, for those that know the story of Hamilton, it was this, this ragtag, eclectic group of folks that came together to you know, transform the trajectory of our nation. And in the song, uh, they say, what are the odds the gods would put us all in one spot? 
And I think back to our days at Rutgers, what are the odds the gods would put us all in one spot uh, that those seeds would be planted? Uh, because what your listeners know, what your viewers know is it is difficult. A, a, a partnership in business is second only to being married. The need for communication, the sharing of financial responsibilities, the, 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 the communication and the ability to get along with each other and, and to disagree without being disagreeable, all those things apply. So we started our business, our first company in 1993, which means in 2023, that's 30 years that we have been together in business, three decades. And, you, and, I, and, and I come across so many entrepreneurs who have had disastrous experiences with forming partnerships whether it be with family, with friends, or with business partnerships that have crumbled financial disrepair, broken relationships. So I do not take for granted that I've had three black men as partners for three decades. Yes. And not only are we still together, but we still get along. <laughs> and I can bear witness, guys. This is not just running for the gram or whatever. They really do. It's, it's a beautiful thing to see you brothers together. Um, and, and this whole thing about how to, the, the challenges of maintaining healthy partnerships over time, like you said, whether you're talking about personal relationships or business relationships, is very, very, very real. Um, I, I just finished a stint my first year as a lead mentor for Black Ambition, for REL's program supporting black founders, black and brown founders. And one of, and one of my, my mentees, was that was one of the challenges they were struggling with. It, it was a challenge with the partnership, and, and they navigated it well, I have to give them credit and i'm not going to obviously say who they are and, and the name of their company but it's a real thing it but is. you almost can't build companies of size and of scale without establishing some degree of partnership and again not every partnership is meant to last forever um right. you know but there are but not all partnerships end in a healthy way and and like you said you guys are a rarity and like i said there's a lot of lessons that that i think will come forward that will benefit a, a, you know other entrepreneurs, certainly other Black entrepreneurs. As time goes by, as you guys you know decide when you want to, when and how you want to reveal that story, which again you have told that story on in some forms and some platforms. Uh, yeah, the book, is, the book is coming. The book is coming, Alfred. Uh, at some point, we talked about it, but we're still writing chapters of the book, um, but it's coming. And I'll mention parenthetically, my fifth book will come out in March of this year. Uh, to our earlier topic, data driven DEI will come out in March. Okay, well, I want to jump into that, and I'm, and I'm, glad, I'm, I'm glad you said everything, because I'm glad that the book I want is coming. Um, <laughs> I urge you guys, if you haven't already read, you know, Randall's books that he's either off, written himself or co-authored with others, um, Dr. Jeffrey Robinson in particular, who, who uh, we just had at, at Black Men Excel this past October. He did a good job. You can be proud how he how he represented. Um, and uh, But I'm, I'm glad to you know, hear about this, this new book, um, and I want to talk about that, because the question for this show is we're, we're now going on three years, four years past the murder of George Floyd. Maybe we're two years, two and a half years past that wave of pledges of major corporations of committing to, to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion with the emphasis you said on equity. Um, and when we think equity, of course, we're thinking a lot of things, but black owned businesses, the degree to which we were engaged in the economy, we were growing. And while it's still, you know, I told me we're not really going to be able to tell probably for five years what the, what, what the impact is going to be. But, but I think it is not too early to ask the question I'm asking you today. Are black founders, are black owned businesses winning in the current marketplace? And to the degree that we are, where do you see the wins to the degree that we aren't? or that, co that corporate America is not being as effective uh, against the goals and the intentions of, of the many of the programs and the announcements and the, and the directives that, that, that came out and, you know, and what was called performative justice in many cases. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're in a unique position, BCT Partners is in a unique position because of the work that you do anyway, to say, here's, here's what's happening. And, and, you know, and, and I'm sure a lot of this is gonna come out in your new book as well. But I just yeah. wanted to get you on the show to talk about, you know, where where are we going and are we winning? Yeah, you know, I I can speak from what I see and from where I sit. I believe Black-owned businesses are, generally speaking, doing better. I don't think there's ever been a better time in our generation's life to be a Black-owned business, uh, and that's for for two reasons. One, the heightened 
awareness and conversation around equity in black communities from the murder of George Floyd has put a spotlight on black owned businesses. But here's the other dynamic, which you also have, have given voice to. The, you know, in, in corporate America, there's been efforts to try to diversify their leadership ranks, their decision-making ranks, which has put more black people in charge of budgets. You know, I often talk about, you know, uh, NWA, uh, the old hip hop group, which I won't cite their name because it's got an, an expletive in it. But I say my business is built on NWBs, Negroes with budgets. So if I can't get access to folks who are willing to give us a shot, I can't penetrate these large organizations. So the increase of representation in decision making and the heightened awareness and uh, appreciation of equity issues in the black community, I think has set the stage uh, for black businesses to really see progress. I've seen corporations measurably increase their diverse supplier spend since George Floyd's murder. More companies in the billion dollar round table, more companies either expanding or establishing supplier diversity programs. So the list goes on. I've seen by and large improvements for black owned businesses. You know, you make a really good point. Um, if we talk about pre, let's say pre 2020, post 2020, pre murder of George Floyd, pre-COVID, post-2020. Diversity and inclusion was always a mantra, maybe since, you know, we'll call it the 90s. Let's call it that, yeah. So, but that meant that most large companies had a, a diversity leader, whether they were C-suite or not. They had programs around diversity and inclusion um, and and, and I, I'm trying to be very kind because I think the chief diversity officers or the people in, in, with that role in companies, black or otherwise, did do a lot to open doors. Mm -hmm. But I would say, and this is not me saying, I'm speaking for myself, not you, they, were, they could get you in the door, but they couldn't always get you to the budgets. They didn't have the budgets. Their budgets <laughs> were more outreach, connection, you know, Agreed. being present at conferences like, you know, the Black Enterprise Entrepreneur Summit or the Urban League Conference and, right. and saying, OK, we're going to meet these entrepreneurs, let them know what we need and get them in the door. Mm -hmm. But then too often, nothing would happen after that because mm -hmm. of the person, they didn't have budget. They couldn't really, that person that can get you in the door didn't have budget. But okay. you're right. And post, with the addition of equity, equity says there's got to be a measurable result on a, right. a financial measurable result because equity is about ownership. Mm -hmm. And so you're right. Not only am I seeing chief diversity officers more empowered, not necessarily getting more budget, but more empowered. Right. But they are also being brought to people. They're able to bring you to people in the organization with budget who are expected to actually use that budget to accomplish the directives or the announcements or the pronouncements that might have been made in 2020 when everybody obviously was at a heightened sense of awareness. So, mm -hmm. so you know, whether it's more black people in decision-making positions in corporate America who have budget and can have the power to spend it, or non-black people who are still expected to move the needle when a black company, a black executive, a black walks into the room and says, you guys made this promise. I'm getting the sense, and not, not just from, you know, our work at Black Enterprise, but other people I've had on the show yeah. Um, that, that now there's a real thing internally. And, and I think it underscores something that Earl Graves, our founder, our late founder, always underscored that, yes, you, 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 it's not black business ownership versus black mm -hmm. people in corporate America, that you've mm -hmm. got to have both of those equations if you're really going to grow business of scale and have that's some right. influence that's going to, in terms of the decision making about how money is spent, um, in, in major corporations. That's right. You know, and, and the, 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 the juxtaposition of where I sit is I, I actually have two lenses on this. So I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a black entrepreneur, so I see incoming opportunity, but I run a firm that's advising companies on how to engage with black entrepreneurs too. Like that's the work we're doing at BCT around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So among the most fascinating discussions I've had has post George Floyd has been with white executives with me one-on-one -on -one, having a very candid conversation saying to me, Randall, how can I pursue an agenda that is explicit about wanting to help black businesses and black people 
and not get backlash from people within my organization or from the public. And that's a real conversation. They're like, how do I do it? How do I, how do I not, how do I, do I cast a wide net and call this thing minority or people of color or equity for all? Or do I say, Randall, I'm here to help black owned businesses. And my response to them, it's not an either or. It can be an and. And I, I channel John Powell's theoretical construct of targeted universalism. Sounds fancy. But all targeted universalism says I can have a targeted strategy for a very specific group under the universal goal of helping everyone. So in other words, I can say, I'm gonna have a very specific program to help black owned businesses under the universal goal of equity. And it's not at odds with each other, it can be complementary because what we know is black people are the canary in the coal mine. What you do for black people is an indicator of whether you're doing well for everyone else because we're often the hardest hit and the least represented of all the groups. So if you help black people, as a canary in the coal mine, you're helping everyone. You know, again, you're echoing a theme that I heard so many times about the degree which, that one of the biggest turning points of, of this whole 2020 watershed event, or a series of water, watershed of events that impact of course for America, is even just the ability to have an open, honest conversation, open, honest conversation with white executives about black issues, uh, you know, mm -hmm. um, our, my my co-host on another show, a good friend, um, DC Marshall, um, her company's a diver diverse and engaged, you know, and she's been on the show too as well. Mm -hmm. Talks specifically about what it meant for people to stop using or talking around the issue by you can minority people of color and, and, and for the first time in corporate America, no black people are like, no, we mean black, black, black. <laughs> yeah. We, you know, but as you said, but that freed not only black people to, to find their voice in corporate America and say, no, we really want you to address this, but you're right. It does. It did free up non-black people in corporate America to say, mm -hmm. you know, can, at least mm -hmm. be able to ask the question, how do I do this as you, and again, if you're a CEO, uh, of a major of a fortune 50 or fortune, you know, even 1000 company, you're still trying to navigate this through the, through, through the lens of a broad, often international lens. Um, and you do have to balance out those priorities. And, and many of those, those conversations are had with our CEO, Butch Graves, he has a series similar to this called from the corner office, where he's, he's interviewed many of these CEOs to, to talk about having these kind of candid conversations, but a big reason, or at least a big difference between pre-2020 and post-2020 is that at least you can have the conversation. Whereas right. before, it, either companies like, I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want, you know, let me not, you know, let me let my communication specialist handle that. And and, and we will tell, say what we can say, what we can't say. And there's still a certain amount, there, there's a necessary amount of guardedness around that because you talk about mm -hmm. shareholder value and, and protecting the, the interests of stakeholders. But it's, it's still a more open conversation that we could have had um, as recently as four years ago. Agreed, agreed, agreed 100%. Uh, it has changed the dynamic. You know, I, I say to folks, you know, the old school was that you didn't have these conversations on the job about race and about inequities. Uh, that was not within the confines of what co corporate culture would, 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 would invite. But now we're saying, to corporations, you want to have these conversations for two reasons. First, because by having the conversation, you are creating greater understanding amongst uh, the folks within your organization. And by doing so, you're creating greater inclusivity of those that are a part of your organization as well, because people can feel more inclined for their voices to be heard, for their perspectives to be valued, and for all of us to be having a dialogue, which is about understanding, as opposed to a debate, which is about trying to convince one another. Dialogue is one of the keys to inclusivity. Um, so I, I, I'm with you. Uh, it's been, again, we talk about bringing your whole self to work. I'm like, you don't really want me to bring my whole self to work <laughs> because that might scare you. But what you do want me to do is bring my best self to work. And by having these dialogues, we open the door for people to bring their best self to work. You know, the, the other thing that, that I think as a result of COVID, both in terms of physical health, um, psychological health, mental wellness, 
and in the case of this conversation, the environments in which we work and do business. And again, this doesn't just apply to black people, it applies to everybody in the organization, is the need to feel safe. Like mm -hmm. if I'm a white person, a middle manager in corporate America, who, do, who, 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 who doesn't really understand the challenges of my black staffers or my Latino staffers or my gay staffers or whatever, how can I address that if I feel like if I say the wrong thing, mm -hmm. I could be fired, I could be attacked, I could be labeled. And, and so again, it's this idea of corporate America's responsibility to create safe spaces within the organization for these conversations to take place. Because as you say, if you can't have those dialogues, what happens is the status quo is maintained. Um, That's right. you know, everybody sees the elephant in the room. Everybody knows what's going on, but nobody's going to say anything because I don't want to be the one that, you know, so, so my, my feeling is that spaces are safer and that's mm -hmm. not just about, you know, kind of, um, you know, open wind free, feel good mm -hmm. coming to work. It's about, can we have the conversations necessary to change the systems, to change the way we operate, to deliver that the, the post George Floyd era equity promises mm -hmm. that we are, we all say that we're working toward to the degree that the company is committed to that. Mm -hmm. How is that? What, what are the signs? I want to say how is that? What are the signs that you're seeing that are measurable um, in terms of the work of BCT, in terms of your own observations as an expert in the space, that these things are happening a positive effect for black founders, black companies, uh, and black business? Yeah, you know, we think about this in four dimensions. Some would call it the four dimensions of racism, um, personal, interpersonal, institutional and systemic. Personal is addressing people's beliefs. And that's the hardest of the four because beliefs can be very deep seated. Um, but to our conversation about dialogue and understanding, that can shift people's beliefs. It's okay to focus on black, black businesses. It's okay to have a targeted effort around increasing spend with black owned businesses. That's first. Second is interpersonal, which is people's behaviors. Are people making the behaviors, making the choice, being intentional about how they're engaging with black owned business? Again, we're seeing changes in their behaviors toward black business. Now, does that does, does the old adage still apply? Uh, nobody gets fired for hiring IBM? Yeah, it does. But has the has the the hurdle been lowered to people saying, I can give a black owned business a shot? I would argue yes. I would argue yes. Third is institutional, which is changing the culture of organizations, the, the, the norms and the standards on how they do business. You know, who's on their supplier list, who's not? Who's getting access to the RFPs, who's not? Who's in the room when making the decisions about where to spend the money and who's not? We're seeing institutional changes that we can measure of representation, dollars being spent, black businesses getting shortlisted, et cetera. And then lastly is the systemic, which is those barriers that exist across multiple institutions. An example of a systemic barrier is like redlining, where banks were denying loans across the industry. It wasn't just one bank that did it, it was multiple banks. That's an institution, that's a systemic barrier across multiple institutions. That's where we'll probably see the slowest progress and the most difficult to measure. But again, when I look at, say, what Project Black is doing at Ariel Capital with opening up a fund for diverse suppliers, when I look at the National Minority Supplier Development Council and their trillion dollar aspiration across institutions, when I look at um, efforts to get black products onto retail shelves, and in, that's both online and physical, those are systemic changes across institutions that we're seeing measurable signs of progress. So we're, we're headed in the right direction, I think it's fair to say. And, 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 we, and let's be honest, part of the fact that we're headed in the right direction is that when the baseline is zero, 2% <laughs> is a huge improvement. Um, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in Black Enterprise, often when we, we do our measurements of the best companies for diversity or, you know, the, 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 you know when we're looking at corporate Americans performing, we, we lament the fact that too often we're measuring the best of the worst uh, because... Mm -hmm. Every corp and, and today, I think most corporations are honest or more honest that no matter what they're doing that's better, they have a lot more to do. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But that said, what do you think needs to happen? We've, we've already seen some reports 
of certain companies, you know, whether it's because of, you know, the fear of recession or other factors, pulling back on some of the things that they may have started in 20 and 2021 and then they got to 2022, they, uh, we might need to, you know, cut that back. Not every company is doing that, but we see some companies doing that. What do you think needs to happen going forward? And I, I want to look at it several buckets, but so that what we're seeing is short-term progress is sustained and turned into long-term progress. Because to your point, to get to that measurement of institutional progress, mm-hmm. it's, you're probably not going to see that progress or the fruits of that progress for another couple of decades. Like we're not yeah. going to know until you know I'm well, you know, <laughs> out of the game, and, and you're looking at you know what island you want to buy so you can chill on for the rest of your life. Um, <laughs> but we're talking, you know, that's a long game that people coming behind us will be responsible for measuring and, and, and giving the grade. But what do you see having to happen for us to get to, or at least to stay on the path of progress and direction, let's say over the next two to five years? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, we do a lot of work with our clients around, you know, unconscious bias and mitigating bias and fostering inclusivity. And I'll say something we say in those trainings that applies to, the, to your question. We say to folks, It's much easier to remove bias from a process than it is from a person. So if I blind a resume, you know, you can't see the name on the resume. If you had a bias against black people and it's triggered by seeing the name, then by removing the name, I mitigate the bias. It can't get triggered because I've removed it from the process. It doesn't matter if the person had the bias. So to your question, the most savvy, uh, strategists that I've seen around DEI post George Floyd. I'm thinking about organizations like Bristol Myers Squibb, Robert Wood Johnson, Barnabas Health, who we're working with. Um, They have been laser-like focused on changing process that therefore dictates the behaviors of people. So for example, they are mandating uh, diverse representation in the interview pool and, and beyond the Rooney rule, which just says we have to have representation, but rather we're also training managers on how to mitigate bias in their decision making and taking additional steps like, again, blinding names on resumes so that there's a more equitable playing field. They are ensuring that when they're designing their procurement processes, that they're mindful of the barriers, the systemic and institutional barriers that often exist around pre-qualification, around insurance, around bonding, and that they're mitigating and addressing those barriers before RFPs are even being released. But when you institutionalize these changes, so that it's not giving people discretion of whether to do it or not. Like for now on, black owned businesses, 30 days net to get paid. For now on, black owned businesses must be in our short list for when we're issuing RFPs and when we're awarding contracts. Like those kinds of systemic fundamental changes take the window of opportunity and change it from a moment to a movement because the process change will transcend whoever the people are. Yeah, and and, and again, it's almost like retraining because after a while when that becomes culture change, process change sustained becomes culture change. And mm-hmm. then culture change starts to change the norms of behavior. Uh, because I always tell people, it's, it's not so much about changing individual behaviors, it's changing the norms of behavior so that most mm-hmm. people, not all mm-hmm. people, at most times will say, this is the choice we should make. And that's about culture change. It's about culture building. It's about, we were, I work for this company and this is what we do at this company, even though my personal beliefs may be on one end or the other end of the, 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 the spectrum of whether I agree with that, but this is where I work and this is what we do. This is what we mm-hmm. wear, this is how we think, this is what we do. And, and a big part of the long game of institutional change um, is, is about culture change. And you know, I, 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 again, when I talk to entrepreneurs and even I can remember some particular class I took at Stanford University um, years ago, when you know we talk about what our true culture uh, whether it's individual or institutional culture and values are, our true culture and values are, are the things that we do even when it hurts. Like we know it's not good for us, but we just do it because it's like that's what we should be doing. So there's what the mm-hmm. company's stated core values are, and they always say the right thing. We, we value all people and we embrace diversity. And then there's what the real culture is inside an organization. Um, 
on, on a whole separate topic, I just read a really great article in Psychology Today about what happens when a, a company um, goes off the rails in terms of their ethical decision making and, and how it's rarely just a few unethical individuals in the company. There's mm -hmm. something in the culture that may, and they identify like seven things in a culture that makes likely that a company is going to go rogue and do something, you know, crazy, whether it's, you know, bypassing regulations for safety in a car or whatever. But that is the same principle that your ability to, like you said, remove, in your case, bias from the process so that the process changes behavior despite personal biases, but sustaining that over time changes culture. Um, and, 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 I, and from what I'm hearing, what you're saying, you're seeing the best of the companies in the DEI space leaning into that process to get long term results. Absolutely. You know, uh, in, in similar measure to what you said, uh, I often say that culture is not just what we celebrate, it's what we sanction. Mm -hmm. And it's not just what we encourage, it's also what we discourage. And culture changes through very small steps and decisions that people make every day. Uh, you know, I often say to people, you know, we are the keepers of our organization's culture. It's not some nebulous concept. It is a reflection of the decisions and choices that people make every day of what they do and what they don't do, what they say and what they don't say. And to your earlier conversation about uh, what we would term psychological safety, creating an environment where people feel safe in order to speak up. In the absence of the courage to say something, the status quo remains. And so in some ways, the challenge to us as leaders today is the challenge of having the courage or amplifying our voices and having the courage to change the norms that there's a lasting effect left from our efforts. If your organization is the same as you found it, then you, I think Muhammad Ali said this, then you have wasted your time. You wasted your time. And 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 if there was and, and I say to folks, we all have to be able to look back on our careers and say that we fought for something because somebody fought for us. If all you did was toe the line, you know, and sit at the table but not have your voice heard at the table, then you wasted space. So this is the window, and still, and I would say we're still in the window. If you went back and asked folks after Rosa Parks sat refused to give up her seat. Are we in a movement? The day after she didn't give up her seat, they'd be like, what movement are you talking about? I believe we are still in the moment of George Floyd to determine if it is a movement from George Floyd. And the determination of whether it's a movement is on our watch. It's on the decisions that we make every day to transform the moment into hopefully what is a movement. Perfect segue for the home stretch of this conversation. And you're, you're, making, you're reminding me again about things Mr. Graves used to say. Um, they didn't put you on that corporate board because they ran out of smart white people. So <laughs> you're, you're just going to sit on the board to be black on the board without saying anything, without doing anything. As you just said, you're, you're wasting time, you're wasting space, you're waste, wasting opportunity, um, not just for yourself, but for others. Uh, and for the corporation that put you on that board. Like, why? What's the, what was the point? Um, That's right. But That's right. For, for this home stretch, we talked a lot about the change that's happening, that's necessary, that's required, that's needed. Um, on on the the corporate America side of the equation, let's talk about this in terms of black people winning in this DEI equation. You and I have had discussions um, on on other forms around what black founders and black business owners and aspiring black entrepreneurs need to do. This is whether it was pre pre twenty twenty or post twenty twenty. The the, the 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 mindset towards scale, the, the uh, thinking around business and building businesses and and. That, that may, that, that not may, must be different from maybe the role models of the early 20th century, the John Johnsons mm -hmm. of the world. Um, mm -hmm. uh, talk to me about what needs to happen for black business and black founders to continue to win going forward in this new environment on, 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 the, yeah. on our side, if you will. Yeah, yeah, I say we have to combine old school solidarity with new school sophistication. That's what I say. <laughs> Old school solidarity says we got to find strength in numbers. Uh, and that's strength in diverse numbers. That means you've got to look to certainly other black founders and how you can support each other, but also non-black founders 
on how you can collaborate and partner because two heads are always better than one. To our earlier conversation, everyone knows Oprah Winfrey, but Oprah Winfrey had Jeff Jacobs. Yes. Everyone knows Steve Jobs. Steve Wo Jobs has Steve Wozniak. Everyone knows Bill Gates. Bill Gates had Paul Allen. And while you're here to talk to Randall Pinkett, we already said it. Randall Pinkett had Jeffrey Robinson, Dallas Grundy, and Lawrence Hibbert. There's always a team that is the story behind the story. I don't care who the founder is. But then the new school sophistication says, the cheese has moved. We are living in an era of scale. Think Home Depot, think Walmart, think Amazon. Think that what used to be large companies like uh, US Air and American Airlines are now one company, right? FedEx and Kinko's are now one company. Watch me, Merrill Lynch and Bank of America are now one company. The list goes on and on and on. So I'm not saying that you cannot survive if you're small. I'm saying it is harder than ever to survive if you're small, which means the new school sophistication has got to be joint ventures, mergers, acquisitions, and getting access to growth capital. That's why I love what Project Black is doing with access to capital. And we as founders have to put aside our egos and our personalities and our posturing and our politics and realize that it is better to be the captain of a uh, to be lieutenant on a cruise liner than captain of a tugboat. Mm. <laughs> that we have to think about scale, which means you got to give something to get something to get to that scale. Yeah, and I, I tell people if you want, if you if you want to just be the captain of the tugboat, then do that without expecting that you <laughs> with the opportunities and the revenue of the cruise ship. You know, that's what I'm we know that most of American business and not just black business is small business. There's nothing wrong with that. That's right. Nothing but, wrong with that. But if you're saying, no, I want to, and again, now we're, we're, we're at a good stage of, of mindset, I think, particularly for younger African-Americans are thinking about multi-generational wealth. They mm -hmm. are thinking for the first time in terms of billions and not just millions. It's, just, it's a wonderful thing. But you have to understand to get to that goal, to, your, to underscore your point. And, and actually, Bob Johnson, who, who is probably the, the, the best example of, of someone who's done this, you know, as, as much as he was vilified for selling BET, mm -hmm. but he, he created BET, sold, took it public, took it private again, sold it, invest, you know, and now owns multiple other businesses and multiple other spaces that, that, that your, your capacity to scale, to acquire, to sell, to buy yeah. is how you build significant wealth and certainly how you build scalable businesses. And, yeah. and, 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 uh, you, you really have laid out a mindset not only for winning in the post DEI, you know, space, which is going to change. It's going to be a new era, five That's to ten right. years from now. Um, hopefully, it won't be a result of the catastrophic experiences of 2020 or something like that. But things are going to happen. But we're talking beyond those things. We're talking about what it really takes to to get to what now needs. You know, next generation is going to need to be thinking in terms of trillions and not billions. That's right. Um, because that's, yeah. what, that's what scaling is. That's what scaling is going to be as we move deeper into the 21st century. That's right. You know, and, 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 and we practice what we preach at BCT. I mean, mm -hmm. we've done four joint ventures over the course of our trajectory, um, two with white-owned firms, two with black-owned businesses. We've done two acquisitions over the past three years, now four years, 2023, 2019, and then 2022. And, like, I get it now. I see it. And I wish I had... You know, you know, hit, you know, uh, experience is the best teacher, and hindsight is twenty twenty. But now that I've seen the possibilities of mergers and acquisitions of joint ventures, uh, as few and and there's lots of baby boomers who are retiring, who have owned businesses and don't have children to pass them on to. The market right now for buying and selling businesses has never been more active because of retiring baby boomers. So for those that are watching and listening, I encourage you, think really intentionally, is there a business out there looking to get sold that can help me to grow my own business? Oh, that's a word right there. That's a word right there. Listen, we got a few minutes remaining. Um, I want to, again, just thank you so much for, you know, just for being who you are always. You're always sharing so liberally, really, really valuable lessons from experiences, including lessons you just learned since the last time I talked to you. It's really <laughs> appreciated. But what's the best way for the Beyond 
the hype audience to stay on top of what BCT is doing, what you're doing, um, so they can make sure they're they're ready for this book when it comes out. Um, mm -hmm. you, you, I just want to make sure that you know beyond the hype, it's, it's like it's always the beginning of a conversation, not the end of a conversation. And our audience always knows I expect them to do their own follow up to stay on top of these subjects. Well, Alfred, I, I appreciate the dialogue and, and I appreciate your voice and your leadership. You have been a consistent advocate for black business. Uh, you know, I, I, I talk often about uh, purpose and the two most important days of your life being the day you were born, and the day you figure out why you were born. Like you have lived a purpose driven life. It all makes sense when I look at the trajectory of Alfred Edmonds career from beyond the hype to black enterprise to what you've done as an entrepreneur as well. I mean, it just all tells a powerful story uh, about being purpose driven. So thank you for the invitation, but more importantly, thank you for all that you've done and all that you're doing and all that you're gonna do. Um, for those that wanna learn more about me, BCT, um, you can hit me at Randall Pinkett on all forms of social media, Randall with one L. You can learn about BCT at bctpartners.com. And if you are out there looking or uh, know of people looking for any supports to advance or accelerate their diversity, equity, and inclusion agenda, be it small organization, medium or large, you think, then, you know, as they say, holler at us because we have been doing this now uh, for 23 years at BCT, founded in 2000. And we got 23 years that lie ahead of uh, doing this equity centered work. And there's more on the way. Bro, I'm so appreciative of you joining us um, for the show. Um, I'm looking forward to our post COVID face to face reunion. <laughs> I always tell people, yeah, we were seeing each other, but I can't wait to just see you personally. And uh, listen, thank you for my, being my guest on Beyond the Hype. Thank you, Alfred. And also to your watchers and listeners, uh, again, the last book, Black Faces in High Places. One before that, Black Faces in White Places. And then uh, March this year, Data Driven DI will hit bookshelves. So, you know, check out your boy. Data Thanks, Driven Alfred. DI. I'm going to be all, all over that, bro. Trust me. This has been another great edition of Beyond the Hype. I'm your host, Alfred Edmund Jr. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time.